Hi, everyone. I'm Max Neely Cohen. I'm a former artist in residence at Culture Hub. And I'm here to help moderate a discussion with three amazing artists and brains who work with generative text and language and technology in both similar and different veins to the amazing work of Lons you just saw. And all three of them are going to show you a little bit of their work and what it means for authorship and style. And then we're going to talk about it a little bit. So first up, we have Allison Parrish. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I have some slides. I don't know if everybody can see that, but the slides are there. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I call it font aesthetic style, because we were uh, uh, sort of nominally tasked with talking about um, style and machine learning uh, today. Um, but this, you know, it was a different presentation. I just put this title on it. Um, so I want to talk about a machine learning model of phonetics for creative font aesthetics that I've been working on uh, lately as part of my practice. Um, Wait, were we supposed to introduce ourselves? Yeah. I think we were. I'm Allison Parrish. <laughs> I'm an assistant <laughs> arts professor at um, NYU's uh, interactive telecommunications program slash interactive media arts program. And I am a computer programmer and a poet. Um, so machine learning model of uh, phonetics for creative font aesthetics. I want to take you through the model and what it can do. And I have a piece at the end that I'm going to show you and read. Um, so uh, this project started with research on phonetic similarity. I wanted a way to assign coordinates to words in such a way that words with similar sounds would be near to each other if you visualize them on a scatter plot like this. Um, so that you could say that like the words octopus and apocalypse are similar in sound compared to inky and kinky. Both of those pairs are similar, but they're not similar to each other um, as pairs. Um, there's an easy way to get started with this, which is the CMU Pronouncing Dictionary. It's a, a a uh, freely available uh, dictionary of words and their phonetic transcriptions. Um, my initial uh, work with this was based on a statistical model of the way that phonemes work in these in these words by breaking the phonemes up into their um, up into their lower level features and then building a statistical model of that, I was able to come up with a way of changing a word into its transcription into a number that represented the sound of that word. Um, that model I used to compose um, articulations, which came out, um, it was published two years ago uh, by Counterpath Press, my first uh, full-length volume of poetry, um, in which the, the book compo is composed of a, a long prose poem in which um, each, uh, uh, each uh, paragraph consists of multiple words that are selected from a large corpus of poetry, um, and the words are glued together based on how phonetically similar they are. Um, so I'm not going to read this. I might read like the first part so you get an idea. These are all lines of poetry from Project Gutenberg, an open, uh, but freely available um, uh, corpus of public domain uh, texts. Um, so you get connections like sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, it was the hour of prayers, and the hour of parting, hour of parting, hour of meeting, hour of parting this with power avenging his towering wings, his power enhancing in his power, his power thus the blithe powers about the flowers, chirp about the flowers, a power of butterflies, so forth, so forth. So it's a, a kind of poetry in which um, phonetic cohesion is the only, um, is the only com uh, compu uh, comp uh, compositional, sorry, compositional uh, um, strategy. Um, where this model sort of broke down is when I got interested in um, sound poetry and nonsense poetry. Uh, this is an example of Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven's uh, Dada sound poetry. This is a piece called um, I Gassing Rin Jalamund. These are all um, made up words. They were words that were made up for the purpose of this poem. Um, my model was unable to cope with this because it was based, it only worked for words that were in the CMU Pronouncing Dictionary. So if I wanted to be able to compose poetry like this using a computer, which I do um, for some reason, I need a machine learning model um, that uh, can work out how words sound, not just words that are in the dictionary, but like words that you make up. Um, so. Uh, neural networks to the rescue. Um, this is a, a block diagram of the neural network um, that I've been working with that I, I made the architecture for and trained on the CMU Pronouncing Dictionary. Basically, it is a sequence of two um, sequence to sequence models, one that knows how to sound out words from spelling and the other that knows how to spell words based on how they sound. Um, and so you put a word in and then it actually like predicts the spelling of that word based on how it sounds, which is kind of 
weird. You wouldn't really want to do that in practice because if you already know how a word is spelled, you don't have to um, ask a computer how it's spelled. Um, but the interesting thing about this model is that you can tap into different parts of it. Um, so you can take that the, the feature representations in the middle of the network, um, or you can use the process when it's predicting what the next phoneme is going to be. You can sort of tap into all of those parts and perform creative manipulations of the underlying data structures of the neural network to produce um, predictions that are more interesting. Um, so among the things that you can do with this model, one is um, what I'm saying is denoising sequences of random characters by sounding them out. So you can put in essentially random sequences of characters and then it gives you like a phonetic pronunciation of those, like the um, NBA has for like the names of players. Um, so you put in a, uh, just any random sequence of characters and it tries its best to, to spell them out. Um, another variation of this is um, inventing new magic words by taking the um, phoneme the phoneme feature vector and then adding random noise to it and then um, doing inference from that randomly generated noises. So this is like variations on the word abracadabra. You have abracadabra, 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 uh, abracabida, amricadabra, abracadobo, um, abracabadara, amrica trabar, ablabadara, abracahada, aronakada, agracabparbog, ibrabigra, <laughs> Bigra Bergmba, Actro Capta, Afi Baba Gribidi, Erbrax Bragabad, Ulvam and Vam Hamna Havma, and Ofo Volder. Abracadabra is traditionally uh, an apotropaic word. It, it wards away um, danger. So I think, I think I've just warded away all kinds of danger by doing this, um, by saying these words out loud. Um, another thing I've been working with quite frequently is um, the model's ability to um, interpolate between words. So if you find the underlying phonetic feature vector for two words, um, then you can average that and then use that as a starting point for where the vector, uh, for where the model will spell the word. So you can invent new words that are between two other words. So halfway between paper and plastic is pasit, halfway between kitten and puppy is putpi. Halfway between birthday and anniversary is Arthur Day, and halfway between artificial and intelligence is IntelliFissile. These are new words that are invented by the model. Um, another feature of this model that I've been working with quite a bit, I sped up this video, but I don't think I sped it up enough. What this is doing is it's manipulating the, the uh, the probabilities of the underlying phonetic features at the point of prediction. So what you can do is you can um, say, I want a particular part of the mouth to be used more when you're spelling out this word. So you can kind of make it like, uh, spell as though it has a head cold, spell as though like your mouth is full when you're saying something or things like that. Or it can also do, um, you can do like meme stuff. I don't know if I have in this video, let me, well. Anyway, this is, this is a fun thing. Um, uh, uh, but the, the big project, or one of the big projects that I've been working on with this is um, Compasses, which is a chapbook in Andreas Bolhoff's Sync series. It came out uh, last year um, in which I use this model to um, write poems that uh, start with uh, quartets of words, words that, that occur in, in natural quartets that don't necessarily have a natural ordering to them. And then I use the model to find the words um, in between each of those words. Um, and then I average together all of those words and put that word in the middle, giving you sort of this um, uh, composition um, based on phonetic similarity among these, um, among these words. So you get uh, north, earth, east, suet, south, woust, west, worth, earth, um, noon, through, three, this, six, nick, nine, neun, and thine, um, cyan, mine, magenta, maylet, yellow, ballow, black, bleen, mita, and finally, um, Google, agglezen, Amazon, acebound, Facebook, aspool, apple, ogle, aspol. Um, so that's what I've been working on. <laughs> on um, that's my contact information, and that's all for me. All right, we're going to try to change displays real quick. 
Oh, that was really quick. Okay. Awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Katie Giro. I'm a computer scientist and also a writer and a poet. I'm doing a PhD in computer science at Columbia University. And I want to talk to you about a project that I've been working on that also has to do with like changing text based on different like ideas of style, but like a totally different idea of style than the way things sound. So I started thinking about this about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, and I was inspired by all the really cool things that were going on in computer vision. So they were able to do this really cool style transfer stuff that maybe you've seen. This is actually one of the first papers that was written about this, and it's almost five years ago now that they started doing this. And the idea is in the top left-hand corner, you have this photograph, and then you could take a painting and change the style of that photograph to match the painting. So in this particular image, you take the photograph in the top left, and then here are three applications of three different paintings. The painting's the little thumbnail, and it, what it's trying to just affect the style. And if you look at this for a long time and you think what it's doing, um, it seems to be taking the texture of the painting and applying that to like the content and like global structure of the photograph. And actually this stuff has gotten way more sophisticated, it's super cool, now you can just do it in Photoshop, like no big deal. And I was like, this is really cool, but what would this look like for text? Like can you do a similar thing for text? What's the texture of text that you could move around? And I did this, I started working on this with um, my friend Chris Kedzie at Columbia, and we really started thinking about syntax as this thing that was like a surface level feature. Like it wasn't the content. Like you don't want to change actually any of the words that give the sentence meaning. You want to change something else. And so here's an example of what we did or an example of what our system does. So here's uh, you know, a famous line from philosophy. The life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And we said, okay, well, let's just rewrite this sentence to have way more personal pronouns. Like, this is very philosophical and lofty. Let's make it really personal and narrative. And so you tell the system, rewrite this sentence, keep as many of the words as possible, like, insert five personal pronouns. And it says, my life, it was a man, my solitary poor, and I would have nasty her with it, her initial short. So this is doing something, right? Um, something interesting. And the reason why we got on this whole like syntax, pronouns, this kind of thing, um, is kind of inspired by this work that was actually done in the 60s by these statisticians. So there was this big historical problem about the Federalist Papers, where, which were these essays that were written by some of the founding fathers that were trying to convince people to ratify the Constitution. Um, and there were a group of three people who were writing them, but they all published it under a pseudonym. And so for a long time, historians were trying to figure out which essay was by which person. And they were using this, like, using other evidence. But there were a set of the Federalist Papers that they could not find any evidence for, but they really wanted to know. And so in the 60s, these two statisticians were like, I don't know, maybe we can solve this problem for you. And they thought, okay, you can't look at the content words because each essay was about something different. One was about foreign policy, one was about economics, whatever. So you couldn't say, like, Madison liked to write about X because they would all write on these different topics. But they thought maybe there are these other words in there, like of or with or the. And the authors might have like certain predilections towards using those at different frequencies. And so what they did is they took the Federalist Papers that they knew the authors of, and they basically counted words. They were like, how many times did Madison use the? How many times did he use of? And then they looked at the Federalist Papers that were under dispute, and they said, which author does it most match in terms of the frequencies of these meaningless words? And then they could say with some estimation of certainty, because they're statisticians, we think these Federalist Papers have this chance of being from this author. I think the result is that they were all written by Madison, like all the undisputed ones, um, <laughs> which is kind of a funny result. And there was some interesting follow-up in the stats world about how legitimate their numbers were, but they actually wrote a whole book on this, which you can go get from the library and read. It's riveting. There's a lot of math. Um, but this is part of the world of stylometry, which has this idea that these like kind of meaningless words that you don't think are very indicative are actually really indicative of authors or styles or genre. So what Chris and I did is we went and we just took a list of things that we thought 
we could work with. Um, and so this is our list. The first four are actually syntactic things, which ended up being like um, structural, clausal things. So it's like the number of adverbial phrases, the number of fragments, which actually ended up, we still haven't really gotten that to work because actually like rearranging parts of the sentence um, while keeping the fluidity of the sentence is not something we've figured out yet. But the rest are actually literally just counts of words, like how many conjunctions in the sentence, how many determiners, how many helper verbs, negation, that kind of thing. And so we also use a neural network where we give it a sentence and we say, here's the number of, here's the counts of all these different features, and then you can change those counts and say, rewrite this sentence with a new set of features. So um, here's a famous opening line um, from the Romancer. The sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. And you might say, okay, um, this is cool, but it doesn't have enough punctuation. Like, just give me more. And so here's the rewrite. In the sky, the port of color, television, was tuned to the dead channel, that. And so it's doing pretty good. I mean, it, like, it kind of gets what's going on here. Um, you might say that you want like a lot more helper verbs, you just like, and pronouns. And so then it rewrites it as, it would be the, it would be the sky of the port color of the television. I have tuned you on the dead channel. So it's, it's got a couple ideas of what's going on. This is a sentence uh, from Sylvia Plas, the bell jar. I took a deep breath and listened to that old brag of my heart. I am, I am, I am. And you might say, this is way too personal. Um, get rid of all of the personal pronouns um, and let's like increase the punctuation if at all possible. Uh, I think it's also increasing the number of determiners. So then it says, it took a deep breath and listened. That would be old. That would have to be an output of the heart. So it's cool. I mean, it's getting like some of the vibes. So what's kind of interesting about this is that these ideas of this, these like syntactic features and these counts of these like small kind of meaningless words don't like really feel like style sometimes because I think if you like sit down to write something you're not like gotta up the prepositions otherwise no one's gonna know it's me um, but I think it's possible that what's going on here when we think about style in this way is that these kind of counts of these weird features are like a trickle down effect and what you're actually seeing is people really are making these high level decisions like if you are writing a gothic horror novel, maybe you're writing a lot of descriptions of weather and you really care about like placements of objects, right? You're being very imagistic. And then you are gonna use certain kinds of prepositions more often than others if you're writing a lot of descriptive scenes. Or if you're writing you know, certain lengths of sentences or with certain syntax, like clausal constru constructions, you're gonna use certain kinds of punctuation more so than others. So it's possible that this is actually a reflection of what writers are thinking about, but who's to say? I mean, I think I'm still not convinced that I really know what style means when you talk about text. So I'm excited to figure it out. Blair's gonna figure it out for us. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm not so sure I'm gonna figure it out, but um, I'm certainly gonna talk about it. <laughs> um, Okay, so I am Blair Simmons. Uh, I am a lot of things. I am a playwright and um, an artist that uses computation. Um, and I teach and, I don't know, I really like watching television. Um, so I am gonna talk about modeling conversational relevance. I, because I come from a theater background, uh, I was in the middle of a different project that became this project and I was, taking a source text uh, and I was mixing up all the words to create a new monologue. So I was taking like the instructions to inflate a balloon and I was mixing up all the words to create a beautiful monologue. And then I thought to myself, I could just write a computer program that does that. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then I was like, no, no, not right now. We'll do that later. So a year later, I decided to do that. Uh, I did it for my master's thesis at NYU. Um, my advisor was actually um, Allison Parrish sitting right here. <laughs> so I'm honored to be part of this conversation. Um, and 
what I really wanted to do was I wanted to create a play that I could sit in as an audience member for. I wanted to have my theatrical performances surprise me the way that it surprises my audience, and I wanted to create a structure for that. And so to do that, I had to start asking myself, or actually more accurately, Allison was asking me, uh, what makes up a play? Um, what, what are the features? What are the elements that you can hone in on and create a model for? Um, what I ultimately landed on was dialogue. Uh, and I landed on dialogue because it was a particular style of theater that I was trying to emulate. And this was like the theater of, of Pinter. Um, and I really wanted to create dialogue that was people talking past each other and using uh, the same words for different meanings and they, you know, repetitive language. I really wanted to create this. And so, in order to do that, uh, I essentially needed to solve the question of conversational relevance. And I, and I went about using some machine learning techniques like Markov chains and other things, and those all didn't really work for me because they didn't have the memory that I needed them to have to create a scene that made the sort of sense that I wanted it to make. And so I'll show you an example of the types of scenes that my actors read. Um, so here's a scene. The actors can actually take however many lines they want, but I'll just read it for you now. Um, can I add up a column of numbers now? We'll use a computer later. If you, you should be designing software. I, you cannot use a computer anymore. Should I consider designing software? In a headache. When you're fixing a computer, I have a headache. I'm fixing a computer, oops. You have an exhaustion from the, mm, I think so. So uh, here what's happening is the way that I decided through my style, that um, <laughs> I decided to create dialogue through words and phrases that essentially are connected to each other in some way. So we have column of numbers um, and computer. So we kind of see how that could be created. You know, th those could be related. I said created. Um, but designing software makes sense in terms of computers. Um, computer, designing software, headache. And so somewhere, somewhere in the navigation of, of words and phrases, we ended up from designing software at headache. Perhaps maybe designing software gives you a headache. Um, you could make that. that. And, and, and essentially what I wanted to do is I didn't want to make those connections between those words and phrases obvious, but I did want there to be a sense of a connection so that a conversation could be ha happening on stage and in the minds of the audience without me deciding what the, the conversation was going to be about. Um, yeah, and I'll read a second one. Um, we'll buy a house later. It's like you pay for it sometimes, but don't cut your hair without me. All I do is buy a house. I cannot. You pay for it when, really? Can't you cut your hair? I can't pay for it, no. You should improve your image. All you do is cut your hair. I cannot improve your image anymore. I will get a job when I want to get a job, but don't pay cash, really? All you do is get a job. Oh, very well, give me the charge. You want me to pay cash? You're not, you've got a charge here. Did you bring, did they bring you the art? <laughs> I don't know how we got there, but I only have one paint, damn it. There was art here, wow, all I do is illuminate, I'm sorry. That is part of my paint, or isn't that the mini it? Good. To be clear, I don't know that word. Uh, good, <laughs> so that I can illuminate, I think so. A mini it personality, thanks. The color was always, well, emblazoned. Wow, you've got a color there. Um, and so what, what's amazing about this is we have some, some semblance of sense, but the sense is made actually in the reading and in, and in, the, in the perception of the thing. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's really all I wanted to share other than um, I wanted to say that, well, that, that you know, we're dealing with semantic networks. I just wanted to add that little thing in there. Um, and that in order to do this, I actually wanted to start the discussion portion immediately. Um, I 
I had to make a lot of stylistic decisions about what theatrical dialogue was to come to this. Like, this isn't what all theater sounds like, but it's what um, a type of theater, it's almost like a parody of a type of theater. Um, and so, yeah, that's how I feel. And I feel done also, in addition. Great, it's working. Okay. Um, so, uh, my first question for all three of you is uh, all three of you are effectively collaborating with systems you've created um, to a degree, right? Or or not? But I guess I guess what I'm curious is how uh, how your style as a programmer or a creative technologist intersects with your style as a writer or a poet. I can say I have um, sort of a tendency to enjoy nonsense, so that that so I take a lot of pleasure in the types of language that comes out of my program. That's a really oh yep. Um, I think it goes a lot in one way, but not the other. I'm not sure. Like I don't think this particular project where I thought like a lot about prepositions and how often they're being used, like change the way that I use prepositions. But I do think that when I was looking at the academic research on style and the things that they were doing, I did find, as a writer, I found them like lacking and some kind, just kind of like weird and having blind spots. So like a lot of the academic research on style and text will do things where you're like, what do you think style really means? Um, so like there's a style paper that's all about changing the sentiment of a sentence. So it's like, oh, let's try to take a movie review that's negative and rewrite it as a positive movie review. And this is like maybe an interesting thing to do in the world, but it seems weird to me to call that style, right? Like isn't sentiment part of the meaning of the sentence? And I think that's where like sensitivities around thinking about things as a writer or as someone who cares a lot about literature makes me reflect on it a bit differently. Um, I don't have a, a creative writing practice that's separate from my computational yeah, practice, yeah. so I can't, I can't address this issue. No, but I, think that's good, but I think that is a good answer, in a way. To me. I thought it was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> that was the what point. What are you saying? Yeah. No, no, yeah. Um, uh, uh, a more abstract question that um, I've always wanted to ask all three of you, so I'm going to take this opportunity to do it in front of people. Uh, uh, why do you do what you do? <laughs> I must know. Particularly, like, <laughs> particularly, particularly, like, uh, uh, what I, I'm interested in what triggers made you obsessed with this. I think that's like a really so like a Freudian approach. Yeah, so like let's go there. Topic. Let's. <laughs> Allison, Allison, and Katie both hard pass on that one. I don't know. I'm I'm perfectly. I I have like a set pat answer for this. I guess because it's you know no offense, Max. It's a question that's often asked, um, like with some measure of incredulity. Like why? Why would you do this? No, what I say it this? with excitement. I ask okay, it with right. excitement. <laughs> well, you're you're excited, but other people are incredulous. Um, do you do you want me? To, I was I was letting you go first as as my former student. I feel like I need to make space <laughs> for the for the new vanguard. Um, definitely, I have my. I think I think I know your answer, and I think ooh mood lighting, and I think my did I look too sweaty? Was my laugh <laughs> popping too much in the mic? Um, no, I think that my I think my answer is really theater specific and project specific to this is that I because I was trying to solve that particular problem. I think I did touch on that. I really wanted to see a piece of theater that I created without knowing what would happen. That was like a particular problem I was trying to solve. And then once I started upon that, I became obsessed with the fact that I could um, create my own like Steinian experience in theater and and this project was funnier than I thought it would be I think I was I think in my mind I was writing like it's very serious short plays and then and then I got addicted to the laughter but I think that I, I think I but I'll let but your answer is so much better <laughs> uh, for me it's it's a uh, a confluence of just a number of things that I 
that I sort of progressively got interested in as a kid. One was reading J.R.R. Tolkien at an early age and getting interested in um, invented languages and how they seemed to have an expressiveness that resulted from their, first of all, from their like external characteristics, but then also like once you dig into them, there are all these interesting structural linguistic things that um, Tolkien was doing. And I went, to, I went to UC Berkeley to study linguistics specifically because I was interested in this art form. Um, in high school, my creative writing teacher, just as a one-off, had us read um, As a Wife Has a Cow, A Love Story by Gertrude Stein. And that's like sort of coming at the same issues as Tolkien, weirdly, from a different direction of like language being, oper being able to operate in like its own systems. Um, and then I also was, you know, I, I love computer programming like as, as an activity, as um, a, a form of expression, and just as like, you know, it's like it's like knitting or, or quilting for me. So like the the craft aspect of being a computer programmer also folds into that. And then like you see it through the lens of the history of, of the poetic avant-garde and like all, all kinds of um, experimental poetic practices over the course of history, not just in the past hundred years or so, have dealt with algorithmic methods. Um, and I think that's a really exciting um, intellectual uh, heritage to be a part of. Um, so, yes. Yeah, I think maybe I'm a bit similar to Allison, where I'm really interested in language, and I also love computers. Um, and I think a lot of just what I want to do has to do with, like, being able to play with language. Like, I think really when I showed the style, tra the image style transfer stuff, that the stuff that goes on in computer vision is always very inspiring to me because I'm like, oh, they get to do all this cool shit. Like, I don't know, like somehow the visual artists are having way more fun. Um, and sometimes when I try to explain my work in academic contexts, I'll use like Snapchat filters as an example of something that's like really empowering to people. Like people just have so much fun with like making their face into a dog and all this other kind of stuff. Like in a really, not like in a demeaning way, like it's legitimately like empowering and cool and fun and people feel like they can play in a way that people are like afraid to draw a dog because they feel like they can't draw. And I think especially for the style, I was really, and I'm still like, just what does, the text is not like images like there are so many differences and as writers you don't get to use the same kind of tools that visual artists do but I think a lot about like but what if we could or you know when you bridge that analogical gap what do you get on the other side and what does that say about how language is different than the visual arts yeah that's that's a great point like like that with with um, visual uh, tactile media or or other kinds of like non literary media, I guess like you can describe the things that you do with gestures, mm -hmm. right? Um, and like I have this gesture, like I want to do this to language. I want to like <laughs> punch it and stuff. And you can't you can't do that with our with our composition tools. But with computation, you're you're open to these different verbs that you can use to operate on text. And I think that that's super exciting. Yeah. Hear me. We've had a little room of people who have been watching this discussion and the performance, and I wanted to bring them in now so that they could maybe ask some questions and be a part of it. And yeah, the reason we're doing this is because obviously this is uh, uh, closed to the public aside from live streaming, but we wanted to experiment with how we could um, gather people online to watch and engage. Uh, so yeah, can it happen? We're excited to meet you. <laughs> oh. Ah. Hi, Mimi. <laughs> I don't know where she is. I don't know where the camera is. Yeah, it's like Um, Maddie, is that an invitation for us to throw out questions at this point? Yes. 
Can you hear me? We can hear yes. you. Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, cool. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in the room with you, so I can't tell if I'm being heard or seen. Introduce um, yourself. Is, this is a cool. Hi, my name is Benton. I'm also a Culture Hub uh, alum, having done, I don't know, a few projects with, with the team thus far. Um, and I just really enjoy the talk. Um, I've been a fan of computer uh, assisted writing for a long time. I used to have a book of computer poetry. And interestingly enough, for some reason, there was a character named Benton who kept reappearing in the, in the poem. So I don't know uh, where that came from. But I was curious if you could give, you talked about how, um, you know, in the visual, I'm a visual artist and I am likewise amazed at this wealth of uh, tools that just anybody could use. And actually, personally, I believe it's really advancing the art of um, moving visual image. Um, but what is an example of like, the text equivalent to a Snapchat filter, you know? Is there is there something out there like that? that I don't know, like, what if I want to, like, write, um, I don't know, uh, a letter to, uh, to a friend, but I want it to sound like, uh, I don't know, Shakespeare wrote it or whatever. Is there, is there such a thing out there? I mean, one of those is just spell check, right? <laughs> I'm, but I'm, I'm serious about that. Like that, that's absolutely like a algorithmic or a machine learning model that we use every day to play with our text, right? Um, and I think you know both of the projects that that Katie and I showed were both about that operation of text goes in, you move some sliders around, and then you get a different text out. But that specific example, we'll, I'll let Katie address that. Yeah. Uh, well, so first of all, there is like a two Shakespearean thing um, because I don't know there ha there's like because there's modern translation of, of Shakespeare, that's like a pretty easy thing to do. They have a lot of like parallel aligned data, which is cool. Um, but I think there's like a sub question, which is like why I don't think there is the Snapchat equivalent in the sense that people don't use it in the way that people use. Like we're not all sitting here on our phones texting with a little thing that uses Allison's thing that makes it sound like we have a head cold, even though that would be supremely fun. And I'm psyched for the, uh, the, the, um, the, mobile, the mobile version of that. But the, I mean, just like super briefly, I think part of that, and this is what makes this work so interesting, is that we have a really different relation to text than we do to images. Like there's something about manipulating a photograph of yourself that seems like fun and playful and something about like manipulating your text to your mom which might feel deceitful. Um, or it's weird in a way that I think it's not weird for photos, but. I, I would, uh, do you guys use Grammarly? I, no. I've used it only for like research, like to know what's up. Um, <laughs> I have it on my work emails and you can check to see how professional, Formality. How, how formal your email is. And that to me feels like a very, pretty much like everyday use. And I feel like we're pretty close to having something that says, like, your email is too female. Yeah. Like, you're using too many exclamation points. Um, or, or the other way around. And, but there's a question for me of, like, why that hasn't taken off. Like, it would be pretty not, it's not so unreasonable that, like, Gmail might have baked in, like, this is a sad email. I mean, arguably they do. <laughs> like, I there has to be like a, some kind of model, statistical model of of style that's going into the the right the completion the, the smart replies and the yeah. completion and stuff like that, which I always turn off completely in any writing interface I use. I don't use yeah. spell check. I don't use autocomplete. I don't use anything that's suggested by a machine learning model specifically because it like feels like it's writing it for me, which right. I think like addresses like speaks yeah. to your your authenticity issue of like being truthful to your mom with your texts. <laughs> Do you have another question? Uh, I had a question. Oh, sorry. Hey. No, no, please. Hi, Amy. There's just like no feedback. I'm in a bubble. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, 
in listening to the three presentations on text in particular, um, I realized that working with text generatively is, is always an act of regeneration as opposed to um, when you can do generative visual art uh, and it's completely abstracted um, and you're not necessarily quoting or um, depending on resemblance to what has come before to engage human humans in the output of what you're doing. Um, meaning, especially in Allison's examples with the words, um, the, the sort of what, what makes them work or what makes it so that our brain actually latches onto them is just this like odd feeling of familiarity and recognition. And also that anything in English that has the word ass in it somewhere is kind of funny. Um, but, you, you've discovered um, my secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, so I, I was curious, like for all three of you in your research, in your work, like if you've, um, kind of rediscovered things, sort of re-fallen in love with things that, uh, you had forgotten about just, just cause it feels like you're, you're constantly looking and manipulating and working with, um, material that is very familiar actually and, and old um, and I don't know just where your own sort of predilections for things that you like um, factor into the choices that you make for what you put into um, into the algorithms that you're using I feel like mine I uh, I feel like I could explain more parts of my project in order to, to answer this question um, because I have sentence structures that I have written that exist as sort of a branching logic, but they're my sentence structures and they're filled in with the associations of words of other people and other things. And so I have a bit of an amalgamation of other people's associations and my sentence structures. Um, like what I have decided is a valid sentence structure within this context. And so I have the, sorry. Um, so, so, I, so I've made some decisions about what kind of sentences and uh, can be said back and forth between, between people on stage, but, um, but it's the content and the order of sentence structures that is surprising. Um, so yeah, so mine's a bit different in that way. I think one of the interesting things about doing this kind of work, which you're, I think you kind of spoke to, which is a lot of it's old. And the reason why it's old is because you want to use things that are in the public domain. Um, so I never get to work with a recent text. Like I would love <laughs> to work with a recent text. That sounds amazing. I would love to work with novels that have just been published. Um, I think that would be like so much, in some ways, like so much more interesting and so much closer to this idea of the Snapchat filter because it would be so much closer to contemporary culture. And people, you can do this, people do this with tweets, but it's like, I think it's like ethically questionable whether or not we should be using um, tweet text in research, um, even though people do it all the time, but people do all kinds of things all the time that aren't great. Uh, so mostly, you know, I'm working, like you said, like I'm working with things that are at least several decades old. And sometimes I'm kind of just bummed about it. Like it does, I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. But like, it's not my contemporary, right? Like I would love to do something that was a little closer to home. Or maybe I wouldn't actually, who knows? Maybe it would actually be like kind of terrifying or it would like, um, sometimes you don't want things to get too close. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what to what to add to that. Other than yeah, I use I use lots of like um, public domain text specifically for that reason because I want to like have easy ownership over the things that I make. Um, and when it needs data, then that means you have to work with public domain data. But like you know, I am interested in in a particular set of artistic concerns that are that are really only addressed by this small subset of artists. And like, I'm. I'm not at a point where I feel like I have to be apologetic about that. Like it's it's it is totally niche and it is like about a very small set of concerns. So, is there one more question from folks watching or in the chat? 
Yeah, so can, can I ask a question? Yes, please, hi. Hi. Hi, um, so I'm just wondering, so um, I just want to know about like your experience interacting with all of these like text tools and like you're doing your art practice. Do you feel like um, like all these like mach like machine learning models or, or these like uh, trend models that you're dealing with, do you feel that they somehow um, in reverse, like kind of like influence your style, like since we are talking about like style for the whole conversation, do you feel that 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 some kid, like that has some influence and on your like artistic create creating process? I'm just wondering. I'm interested in Blair's answer to that question. Actually, <laughs> like in in your other work as as a playwright. Have you found like sometimes you're you get you get stuck is like the wrong word that's not even close to the word that I wanted but do you like is that something that you find you like use that as like a set of techniques that you can use to solve other problems? Hmm. Um. I guess I'm a bit confused. I'm a bit confused about the question. So I'm gonna try to answer it to the best of my ability. Um. The algorithms that are out there um, have, I actually, I think I experimented with them and rejected them. I think was kind of our experience in my thesis is I, I played with them, I found them to be unsatisfying to my needs, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I'm actually, I'm going to not use machine learning was, was the choice that I made for, for the aesthetic that I wanted. Um, instead, I have chosen sort of the r random features within computation to to create something that is mutable and changes a lot. Um, and I do think that that actually that actually I think comes from from my my playwriting preference um, and not actually out of um, new tools. In fact, like my my program, as Allison knows, is like a mashup of a bunch of different libraries, and it's a mashup of a bunch of different data, so that um, I could I could create the type of play I wanted to create. So I actually think I forced the technology that I had at hand onto um, that that outcome that I wanted. But but that said, what was your significant other's reaction to the first prototype? <laughs> I had to change it because my significant other said that um, it sounded like I was talking on stage <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> um, so I had to kind of, I had, I actually went through a lot of different plays that I liked and I, and I kind of stole their sentence structures instead of just writing from me. So I, so I went and I, I did it some, some, some public domain stealing. Um, so I guess it's not stealing, but, um, but yeah. If that does that does that answer your question? Um, sort of, yeah. Sort of. And so sort just of. to um, explain my questions a little bit, because um, like my own experience, like interacting with um, machine learning models or this like auto generating text um, softwares, sometimes I feel like um, my style, if I'm just talking about like me writing a paragraph or trying to like read something. Like I have my own style and, but somehow when I'm interacting with these models, I feel like um, consciously or unconsciously, I'm influenced by this sort of um, machine, machine aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say like the words or like the result I got sometimes unconsciously mm -hmm. influence what like the outcome that I come up with. So just wondering like what's your feeling or do you feel like reluctant or do, or what's your feeling when interacting with them? Okay, I think I can answer this. Um, yes, so machine learning generated text definitely has an aesthetic. Um, what's kind of interesting is it like changes over time as like the popular machine learning tools change over time. And yes, I totally also feel like you that interacting with them, I'm like, this really isn't what I'm trying. You're often like, this really isn't what I'm trying to do. Um, some people like it. There's actually a writer called Seagal Samuels who wrote a piece, um, I think 
in Vox, but maybe I'm misremembering, where she talked about using this particular language model called GBT2 to like help her write her next novel. And she liked the way it captured um, certain like tonal textures really. And so it would just kind of, it was like plot wise drivel, but like tonally it had a lot of good ideas. So some people find ways to make it work. But I will say that the only tool of mine that I've ever built that I actually use in my own writing practice consistently um, is a thesaurus. So I built this new own thesaurus for myself um, that used something called word embeddings. And basically, you could give it a source text. So you could like give it everything, um, like a bunch of books that Charles Darwin wrote. And then you could like search the Charles Darwin thesaurus. And so you search for the word work, and it'll give you like the most similar words, like in the context of everything Darwin wrote. And it's kind of fun and weird because it's like not always semantically correct, but it's a bit of like a brainstorming thing. Um, there's a, a lot of research about you want things to be like not too far, but not too close. And it does something kind of like that, like a regular thesaurus is, is a bit too close sometimes. And I think the, to your point of like style and aesthetics, the reason why this is the only thing that I've ever used consistently is because it's at the word level. Um, somehow, to me, looking for a single word in a larger sentence doesn't seem to disrupt my own ideas about what something should sound like in the way that being given a whole phrase or sentence does. Ironically, this is the only work I haven't managed to publish in a computer science conference. It's like the one thing that was useful for me. Um, I'm not sure what that says about my career. <laughs> I, I just want to add one more thing to that discussion, um, which is that um, the, your, your question as, as phrased um, implies that these writing interfaces are unique in that they affect the way that we write, and that is not the case. Like every writing interface, whether it's like pen and paper or Google Docs, changes materially the way that we compose and the way that we think and the style of the things that we make and things like that. So I don't think there's anything new about these technologies from that perspective. I think there's a unique um, opportunity afforded to them in like being able to make p tools that are powerful. And there's also unique danger in that like, you know, we, we all use a typewriter now in which Google can inject whatever the words they want, both into our documents and into our brains, right? Um, Maybe other people don't agree with that. It came, no, I, it came out sounding really paranoid when I was saying it, but I, I, think it's absolutely, I think it's absolutely true. If we don't already have sponsored autocomplete, then we will very soon. Um, you type Coke and it says, did you mean Pepsi? Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind, that like every writing interface has a politics. Every writing interface changes the way that we write. But also people have been doing like an analog version of this for a long time. So. Um, you might be writing something and think, oh, I wish my style was like a little bit more like weird and heady and intellectual. And so you go read something that's a little more weird and heady and intellectual to like get you into the zone. Um, like Zadie Smith has talked about this, that there are certain books she'll go to when she wants her writing style to move in a certain direction and she feels like she can pivot it just by reading. Um, I had a poetry instructor who said before she could write anything, she would have to write several pages of just whatever's on her mind, and it was because whatever she had been reading was stuck in there, and she felt like she had to get that out before she could get to her own voice. So this idea of like taking aesthetics from other places is, like Allison said, like not unique to computers. Um, it just feels it feels different somehow, and there are differences, but there are also a lot of analog um, precedents. Uh. I wanted to ask Juan if you wanted to answer this question or any of the other questions <laughs> that we've talked about. Um, I guess I'll just add my answer to the current conversation we're having. Um, I guess in the context of my practice where I'm mainly trying to hack into the space of comedy, um, there are a lot of different mediums that I could have chosen, including I was suggested by many people that you should just go take an improv class so you can become more comfortable with presenting yourself. Um, and at the same time, I was also doing different experiments um, with different um, machine learning tools, including GPT-2. Um, but somehow I feel like 
um, the results that I was given very much alike what you experienced um, made me feel like um, it's like totally out of my control. There's a lot of things that I'm hoping to be more selective about um, that I couldn't really have that freedom. So eventually I think there's a lot of um, pick and choose, kind of decide um, what really works for you. But at the same time, I still no don't know if what I'm working on would actually get me anywhere um, in the realm of comedy. But um, I guess I didn't, at, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is that, um, yeah, there are all a different ways um, for creators, writers, um, programmers to um, find the platforms that um, might work at the moment, might not. Um, you might get into challenges, but, um, you know, it's a process. It's a journey. Um, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Sorry we went a little over, but thanks for all your time. It was really great. And thank thanks, you. everyone, who was streaming and watching us and asked questions. And uh, I'll close by saying, as the non-computational writer on stage, contrary to what you'd think, I love all this stuff. So, you know, don't think that we all hate it.